right, good morning. Glad to have you all out. If you guys want to stand and join us in singing, we're going to sing at the cross. Alas, and did my Savior bleed, and did my sovereign die? Would he devote that sacred hand for such her such as I? At the cross, at the cross, where I first saw the light, and the burden of my heart rolled away. Was there by faith I received my sight, and now I am happy all the day. Was it for crimes that I have done? He groaned upon the tree. Amazing pity, grace unknown, and love beyond degree. At the cross, at the cross, where I first saw the light, and the burden of my heart rolled away. It was there by faith I received my sight, and now I am happy all the day. Well might the sun in darkness hide, and should his glory cross at the cross where I first saw the light and the burden of my heart rolled away. It was there by faith I received my sight and now I am happy all the day. The drops of grief can never repay the dead of where I first saw the light and the burden of my heart rolled away. It was there by faith I received my sight and now I am happy all the day. Of course, I don't think it's a question what motivated the songwriter to say what he said. But the last line of the chorus, but now I'm happy all the day. Have you ever stopped to think about that? Am I really happy? Am I really happy? Now, there are so many things. You know, I've preached many, many times. You know, man is born unto trouble. Jesus said, you know, in this world you shall have tribulation. I find as I grow older in the Lord, I spend more time with him, I'm finding literally that the things that used to make me happy don't really make me happy. He makes me happy. His peace makes me happy. The fact that he's there to comfort me and console me when I go through problems, that makes me happy. You can, as you walk with Christ, if you're born again, as you walk with Christ, that can make you happy. And it, you can be happy literally all the day. So praise the Lord for that. So glad you're here this morning. And uh, we're going to begin by looking at our verse of the week. So if you would, if you'll take a look at the screen. Of course, you always have it in the bulletin as well. We're going to be looking this morning at 1 John chapter 4. Now let's quote verse 14 together. And we have seen and do testify that the Father sent the Son to be the Savior of the world. It's one of those verses that just kind of stick. The words just kind of roll together. And it's one of those verses that you may not even have tried to memorize, but you just know it. You just know it. Tremendous verse in a tremendous passage that we'll be looking at. Of course, uh, you've been given communion cups this morning. Somebody asked me this week, are we ever going to get back to the normal way of doing communion? The answer is yes, but not quite yet, just a little longer, and we'll hopefully get back to that. But if for some reason you don't have a communion cup, we'll make sure you get one if you'd like one this morning for communion uh, toward the end of the service today. As we go to prayer, we want to remember uh, Julie Davis's cousin, Felicity, uh, she gave birth to a baby uh, 15 days ago, and the child has passed away. 
so we need to remember Felicity, and you can only imagine the grief. I mentioned Wednesday night, a missionary we do not support there in Peru, uh, the McCormick family also lost their newborn baby girl. She only lived about 30 minutes. They did not know she had a, um, a heart defect, and she was only able to survive for about 30 minutes. And so, you know, these, these things are griefs. So in the midst of learning to be happy in Christ, finding contentment in him, you still have to deal with these things. So we're going to pray for these folks today, continue to pray for the Marsh family, continue to pray for the Myers. Of course, they both buried loved ones this week, and just ask the Lord to keep them encouraged. So let's go ahead and I'll invite any men that would like to come to the, the platform right now to the altar. We'll meet together to pray. And as we do that, I'm going to ask all of us join together this morning and ask God just to do good work. I'm going to ask Greg Zork. Greg, if you would, I don't know if you remember all the names, and that's okay, but if you come to the pulpit and lead us in prayer, I appreciate that. Thank you. Let's pray. Father God, we do lift up these two children and their, their children's families, Father God, that uh, lost them. Lord, uh, Felicity's family. Father God, this, uh, the people in Peru, Lord, I, we don't understand this, but Father God, uh, you do all things well. And Father God, I pray that you would just co uh, comfort them as only you can. Father God, I pray that you would just uh, take full control over this service today. Father God, come down meet with us. Father God, uh, speak through Pastor Vaughn. Give him clarity of thought. Uh, Lord, uh, help us again to clear our hearts and minds of everything that... Uh, we have done this week and what we're going to do today or tomorrow but father god help us to focus solely on you father god at the end of the day might you say well done and uh might we please you with all that's said and done here today in jesus name amen all right as you turn your seats we're going to go to uh, the next song we're going to sing nothing but the blood and just as we sing this just remember what this song he's talking about. It's talking about that there is nothing but the blood of Jesus that, that could save us. There was, there was nothing that uh, could help us uh, in our predicament that we are in because of our sin. And it took Jesus giving everything and shedding his blood and giving his life and being tortured on that cross for us. And there was nothing that could, there was nothing that could save us unless he did that and he was willing to do that for us. So let's sing out and just, uh, just be joyful in what he did for us and just thank him for it. So we'll begin. What can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. What can make me whole again? Nothing but the blood of
and all my hope and peace, nothing but the blood of Jesus. This is all my righteousness, nothing but the blood of Jesus. Oh, precious is the seated. Thank you. (laughs) I thought pastor was taking his podium back. (laughs) If you're happy to be here, let's get that hand way up in the air. We're going to hold it there. If you're happy the person beside you, in front of you, or behind you is here, we get the other hand up in the air. And while we have our hands in the air, all God's people said, praise the Lord. Uh, Several announcements this morning. First of all, at 5 o'clock, we'll be meeting back here for Bible study hour. The adults and teens will meet here, break out into our groups. The the younger children will be meeting downstairs. Also, after that, we at 6 o'clock or 6 o'clock-ish, we do have our budget meeting for the church. We're trying to keep that as brief as possible, so please make preparations to stay. Uh, Wednesday, we do have our midweek service. So one is at 645. At 7 o'clock, we do have the adults and the teens. The teens are over at the Family Life Center. Now, this Saturday coming up, that's March the 5th. For all you men, we at 9 o'clock, we'll be meeting in the Nicely Room. Uh, we're going to have the men's prayer meeting, and that's exactly what we do. We meet for prayer. So that's this Saturday at 9 o'clock in the morning in the Nicely Room. Now, Sunday, March the 13th, we do have our graced Sunday dinner. We're going to have... Brother Doug Simmons, uh, he'll be with us, a former youth pastor, assistant pastor here at the church coming up, and he'll be our special guest speaker. So that'll be a great time, just a great time of fellowship. Just to be able to to see him again is going to be a great time. Now, Wednesday, March the 16th, for future plans, it's the Awana Grand Prix. If you've never been to an Awana Grand Prix or your child has never participated, it's a great time. So just please keep that in mind, parents. Okay, ladies prayer advance, that's coming up, that's March the 24th through the 26th, that's in Roanoke, Virginia. Uh, There's information in your bulletin on that, you can sign up online, there's still openings left for that. Also in the bulletin, it's been almost 10 years since we've updated the online directory, the the photos in the online directory. Uh, If you haven't updated your photo and you want to, uh, you can send a, a JPEG photo to the church's email that's also listed in your bulletin or you could just give a photograph of your family to Carrie Smith or we could just secretly take a photo of you at a most inopportune time and post it online so it's your choice you could do whatever the three options that we have Uh, opportunities to serve Uh, we do have the Nehemiah project now it took me a long time to find the poster that's downstairs There is a poster downstairs in the fellowship hall. It's actually a poster that's like brilliantly done. And there's little projects there. You could sign up on those projects to do. Uh, The unofficial motto of the Nehemiah project is, if the Lord don't find you handsome, he should at least find you handy. And looking out over the congregation, we have a lot of handy men, so there should be a lot of people signing up today. Okay, we also need nursery workers and that's on the Wednesday evening. We need nursery workers. If you're able to do that, please see Miss Debbie Vaughn for that so she can make sure that she puts you in. The last thing that I have, and this is kind of something that's hit close to home this last week, because I've learned in dealing with my grandkids and dealing with kids on the van and kids in general, you have to stop and ask them questions like, where's your coat? Where's your shoes? Where's your socks? Sometimes it's, where's your coat, where's your cell phone, where's your brother? And sometimes it's, why are you whining, why are you crying? You know, it seems like this never-ending story that happens every week, week after week. And it's kind of frustrating and annoying, but then God reminded me of something. He said, you're my child. And he's constantly asking me, where's your Bible? Where's your prayer list? Where's your faith? Why are you whining? Why are you crying? 
Sometimes it's, where's your heart? Where's your love? Where's your patience? It's something to think about when we get frustrated and annoyed, annoyed at those that are, that are more immature than us and how God must feel the same way. Thank you very much. All right, one correction I have uh, on those announcements uh, for the uh, Awana Grand Prix, we're going to push that back to March 30th, uh, Wednesday, March 30th. That will just give the kids a little bit more time, and we're going to be helping them uh, during the uh, game. We're going to take our game time and uh, take some time to help the kids out, uh, paying their cars, get them ready, and uh, we look forward to, to uh, doing that this year. All right, we're going to go ahead and sing the last song. It's 176, Lead Me to Calvary. And just again, just really consider what the words you're singing uh, and, and what the song is saying. King of my life, I crown thee now. Thine shall the glory be. Lest I forget thy thorn crown brow. Lead me to Calvary. Lest I forget Gethsemane. Lest I forget thine agony. Lest I forget thy love for me. Lead me to Calvary. Show me the tomb where. Just a moment, I'm going to sing a song here, but I want to just mention a few things to you. You'll notice in the bulletin we are having a Financial Peace University class that will be taking place beginning next week through May 16th at 4.30 on Sunday afternoons. Uh, this was uh, announced for many, many weeks, several months actually, with our young adults and college-age people, and so they had first dibs on this. We still have a few openings if you would be interested. I'm not going to go through the much detail with that uh, opportunity. If you are interested, you will need to contact me personally. So if you're interested in that, uh, you will need to contact me you know, here very soon. And then just want to make mention also, when Doug Simmons comes, uh, the reason I'm bringing him in is simply because of what God has done to raise him up. You know, He had the brain aneurysm. He, he went through, I think, two surgeries back to back. And then again in January, I had another episode, another brain surgery. God's been very faithful to him. God's done a lot. He has a great testimony. He's been going around there in South Carolina to different churches sharing what God has done. I thought, you know what, I'd like him to come and share with us what happened and how God has worked in, in his life with that. So he's going to be preaching for us, obviously, but also sharing what God has done with and through that episode with the brain aneurysms. Uh, also, we're going to begin to do something we began before the pandemic, and that was to have a church family meal together after one of the morning services. So we'll begin in this month of March uh, on the 13th. And for this first meal, it'll just be covered dish. Just bring whatever you want. 
And again, I know some people are still very cautious about the pandemic. You're not obligated to take part in that. But if you'd like to, we'd love to have you uh, stay and take part in that. And uh, even for visitors, you're welcome to come and be part of that also. So about once a month, we'll be doing that. And I'll let it up to the ladies how we do that. Maybe some, some months, soup and sandwiches, things like that. But we're going to be doing that at least once a month. So that should be uh, something to look forward to. I think also May 13th or May, March 13th is time change. So that would be nice too. That will enable some of you who aren't able to come right now because of the darkness for the Bible study hour to start attending our Bible study hour as well. And then I really appreciate those that came out for outreach yesterday and just want to encourage you to uh, take the opportunity to come out and minister to people. We had uh, great visits yesterday and gospel was given yesterday. So we want you, if you're a member of this church, uh, to take uh, opportunity to help us share and reach out to others, reach out to church members or people who visit our church or just people in the community. And that certainly would be a, a blessing and a help. So keep those things in mind. take your Bibles and turn to 1st John chapter 4 and before uh, we get into the message this morning uh, is there anyone that does not have a communion cup that would need one anyone at all if you'll just hold your hand up okay we have a couple here so uh, just keep your hands up for a moment and brother Seth will come by and let you grab grab one so we have a few people down here and over here also Seth Like I said, we, this is not our normal way of doing communion. We've done it this way uh, since uh, COVID began, basically. And so 
we're looking to get back to the normal way of doing it. I don't know if there's necessarily a, a right way of doing it, but that's, we'll get back to that normal way that we were used to here in the months to come. So good to have uh, Brother Danny Nicholas back with us this morning, and, and uh, good to have John Starkey. And John, I, I, Megan, glad to have Megan here this morning. I was going to try to remember that, but I forgot already. I saw some possible other visitors walk in as well. And for those who are visiting with us this morning, thank you. Thank you for being here. We're glad you're here, and just trust that the Lord will bless you in being here this morning. First uh, John chapter 4, we're going to be looking at verse 9. First John chapter 4, begin reading in verse 9. And this was manifested the love of God toward us, because that God sent his only begotten Son into the world, that we might live through him. Herein is love, not that we love God, but that God loved us and sent his Son to be the propitiation for our sins. Beloved, if God so loved us, we ought also to love one another. No man hath seen God at any time. If we love one another, God dwelleth in us, and his love is perfected in us. Hereby know we that we dwell in him, and he in us, because he hath given us of his spirit. And we have seen and do testify that the Father sent the Son to be the Savior of the world. Father, I thank you for this book. Thank you for the way it has changed so many of our lives. Thank you for the greatest change when you saved me 45 years ago. Thank you that you took me from death into life. Thank you that you gave me a new father yourself. I praise you for this and thank you that as we take those cups and those wafers and just take time to remember what you did at Calvary, that we will always be grateful. We will never forget, as we just sang, lest we forget thine agony. Lord, lead us constantly to Calvary, our, not just here on a Sunday morning, but throughout our days, throughout the moments of our days. And we'll thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. And this passage is a love story. And I think everyone loves a, a good love story. I, I think even men can get into a good love story. After all, you're married, and hopefully you have a good love story. Hopefully that's true for you. I had one of our ladies, a member of our church, tell me here not too long ago, and she was talking about uh, being basically shut in right now, not able to come. And she was speaking about, you know, what she does through the days, and especially on Sundays. And she made this comment as we're talking. She said, give me my preachers. In other words, uh, give me the men I like to listen to on TV and give me my Hallmark channel. Well, you know, as a man, you know, it's like ESPN, Hallmark, you know. I think I'll, you know, I may pass on that. I don't know if you get too excited about those kind of things. But I do know this. Even a man can enjoy a good love story. I mean, it was a man, actually, who wrote Romeo and Juliet, wasn't it? And you'll notice when he wrote that, it was about two people, not one. I don't think anybody in England would have gone to see Shakespeare's Romeo. You know, there'd been no story there. It was Romeo and Juliet. So sometimes people can love a good love story. In this love story, God is one, and you are the other. This is the greatest and this is the ultimate love story. This is not your typical love story in the sense that this is really life and death. And he loved you so much that he was willing to lay down his life and die for you so that you don't have to die a second death, so that you don't have to experience spiritual death. This is not your average love story. This is the greatest, the best. There's three things I want you to see in this passage this morning before we take part in the Lord's table. I want you to go back to verse 9. And this was manifested the love of God toward us because that God sent his only begotten Son into the world that we might live through him. The first thing I want you to see this morning is this, that God sent his Son that we can live. A love story always begins by someone manifesting their love to another. This love story, the love story between God and me, 
or the love story between you and your God began with God. You notice in this verse he says, in this was manifested the love of God toward us. Now, many times when I preach, we come to the word manifest, it's not a word that we would always use now, but I'll ask you, what does the word manifest means? And you always say, show, and that's exactly what it is. God manifested, God showed, God declared his love for us. Last Saturday at our sweetheart banquet, I invited Pastor Dan Vaughn, and again, for those, same last name, but uh, not related, Brother Dan and his wife, Holly. And when Dan stood up and preached for us, uh, he told us about his love story with Holly. And I thought it was interesting. I, I didn't hear any of those things before. It was all new to me. Uh, Dan and Holly uh, met as teenagers, and he was telling us, I think it was at a Christmas function with family, that he was sitting there, and I think he was 17 years of age, and Dan declared his love for Holly. He said, Holly, I love you. And I love the response. Holly said, you don't know anything about love. Now, you know what? I couldn't say that to God, could I? He's the author of love. He knows everything about love. Well, when Dan heard that, that was a challenge to him. So Dan set out to prove his love to Holly. And a year later, he was 18 years of age. He was 19 and they were married with the blessing of their parents. And they've been married for many years, have five children. God has blessed their marriage greatly. He manifested, he declared his love for Holly. There was a day where God declared his love for me, and he declared his love for you. Now, God declared his love to us. Notice what it says, that we might live. That we might live. John 10, 28 says, and I give unto them eternal life, and they shall never perish, neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. They'll never perish. I'm going to give them a life that never ends. No one really starts living. Now listen carefully to what I'm saying. No one really starts living till you meet Jesus. That's just a reality. You really don't know what life is about until you meet Jesus and receive his love for you. I want you to think for a minute. What, what's living? Well, you have someone who is walking down the street, maybe Main Street and Bridgeport, and all of a sudden this brand new Porsche, or if you like to say Porsche, drives by. And a man says, or maybe you say about the man in that car, man, that's living. Or maybe you decide to go down to Daytona Beach or maybe to St. Petersburg or some place down south where they have a big area where boats dock and all of a sudden you see this super yacht just moseying on by and you look at those people and you say, man, that's living. Uh, we had an experience one time, I think we were leaving here to head down to Georgia to visit family and I never take 77 into Charlotte over 85. I don't like that, it's too crowded. I like cutting across 81 in Withville. I just love the scenery in Tennessee. So as you're traveling down uh, that interstate, down uh, to get toward uh, you know, Georgia, uh, there's a Cracker Barrel somewhere. So I think we had stopped, if I, if I remember this correctly, of course my family will correct me after the service if I get these details wrong. Uh, they, they correct me after services a lot of times, but I'm just teasing. So we're, we're stopping, it was like 12, 1 o'clock for lunch, and we go into this Cracker Barrel, and this helicopter landed in the field beside us. I mean, here's a Cracker Barrel, and here's this field, and this helicopter lands, and the people go in and eat, eat lunch, and then they get back in their helicopter, and they take off. And I'm thinking to myself, man, that'd be great. You know, have your own private helicopter. You know, you say to your wife, hey, let's go to Cracker Barrel. Oh, in Fairmont? No, down in Tennessee. Just take a drive down in your, or a flight down there in your helicopter. And my, my thinking was, man, that's living. Listen, Jesus made this statement, John 10, 10. I am come that they might have life and that they might have it more what? Abundantly. Abundantly. You realize God wants you to be able to say about your Christian life, man, that's living. That's living. When my... Yeah, I often mention my brother-in-law, uh, the one who's an evangelist. 
and uh, do so without any, any shame in that. I, I'm proud of him. I'm glad that God has done such a great work in his life. So when he gets saved out of his wickedness, you know, he was in you know, gang-type activity and criminal activity, and he ran with people in the bars. After his salvation, it was such a great change, he went back to the bar, not to drink, but to tell those men what God had done for him to tell them that his life had changed. He wasn't there to drink. He was there to let them know what Jesus could do for them. And the attitude of those men at that moment was, you'll be back. You know, you'll get over this religious uh, experience, this thrill that you have. It'll, it'll fade, and you'll be back. Well, he never was. He's been preaching for over 50 years. He's been in evangelism for 40 years, and he's, he has never, ever gotten over the thrill of Jesus. And I, I've heard him preach at times at different places, and to hear him say, you know what, some people get a thrill. They think it's living to go out and get drunk. He said, you know what, as a Christian, I've never had a hangover. I've never woken up with a, with a splint headache. He said, you think you're living. You don't know what life is. And he knows both sides. He knows both sides of the track. You are not living until you know Jesus Christ, until you experience his love. I think of John 3, 16, for God so loved the world. That's a broad term. That's because he really does. He loves those people in Ukraine this morning. He loves those believers who are being slaughtered in Miramar today. He loves the believers who are in in fear and hiding in Afghanistan and in North Korea. He loves those people. He loves people who are unsaved and bound in sin. He loves them. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. I want you to notice with me back in Ephesians chapter 2, very special passage. Turn within your Bibles to Ephesians chapter 2. Hope you have your Bibles with you. Ephesians chapter 2, and I want you to look at verse 4. In Ephesians chapter 2, the fourth verse, the Apostle Paul said this, But God, who is rich in mercy for his, now notice this, great love wherewith he loved us, even when we were dead in sins, hath quickened us together with Christ. By grace ye are saved, and hath raised us up together, and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. In the middle verse, verse 5, you notice the statement. He says, he has quickened us. You know what the word quicken means? It means to make you alive. This is living. You and I, before our salvation, were dead in our trespasses and sins, without hope. Jesus came along, and he quickened us. He made us alive. This is living. And how do you live? Notice what he says at the end of verse 9 in 1 John chapter 4. That we might live through him. You cannot have life without the Son. He that hath life hath the Son. And he that hath not the Son of God hath not life, but the wrath of God abideth on him. If you do not have the Son as your Lord and Savior, you cannot know anything but God's wrath. But brother, if you want life, and you want life more abundantly, here's good news. He made the first move. He declared his love for you. There's a second thing I want you to see, and it's found in the next verse, verse 10. Herein is love, not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his Son to be the propitiation for our sins. The second thing I want you to see is this, that God sent his son that we can be covered, that we can be covered. So get this picture. We're talking about a love story. Someone is always the first one to declare their love. And in this instance, God comes along and he declares his love for you. When a love story starts, there's always these romantic feelings and you kind of look at one another as you're faultless. That's, that's just the reality. Just the reality. But a love story does something. It reveals warts. Warts. I mean, I'm sure all of us have had it sometimes on your hand or 
maybe on your face a wart grow and it's, you know, you feel embarrassed by it, those kind of things. A love story will reveal warts. You say, what do you mean by that? In other words, when someone declares their love for another, that love is proven genuine when the lover accepts the love with warts and all. God said, I love you, Jeff. But you don't know me. Yes, I do. I know you better than you know yourself. God saw me, if you will, with my warts. He saw me with my failures, my faults, and my sins. Now listen to me. While we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Christ loved us. The Bible says we transgress, we cross God's line knowingly, we commit iniquity, which is basically wickedness, vile sin, and we just simply miss the mark every day. And that's what the term sin it has in this, as its main meaning. We just miss the mark. You know, sometimes people are pretty decent and they try to do the right things, but we just miss the mark. He said all those things we're all guilty of. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And God makes the first move. He declared as verse 9. He manifested his love toward us. And then... He saw us with all of our warts, all of our sin, all of our iniquity, all of our transgressions. And he said this. Now notice this is special in verse 10. He that loved us sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. What does the word propitiation mean? The word propitiation simply means this. Sin covered Sin remitted. The word remitted, you understand that. It means basically to forgive, to cancel your debt. There's not a person in this room, every man, every woman, every teenager in this room, you owe God a debt because you rebelled against him. You have sinned against the holy God. You have a debt. God comes along, he says, I'm going to declare my love for you. I want to enter into a love relationship with you. But he sees us with our warts. He sees us with our failures and our sins. And in a sense, God says this. And I want, I want you to understand. I want to make sure that you don't misinterpret what I'm saying. God, who declared his love for you and me, has accepted us as we are. I was going up... Uh, the road here on 57 into Simpson the other day, and there's a church up there, and it says, looking for new members, we accept you as you are. Well, in a sense, God does the same thing. God accepts us as we are. Now, let me clarify that. You and I were not demanded to change ourselves or to make ourselves fit in order for God to accept us. And here's why. Because I can't. I cannot make myself fit. God is holy. And he makes it very plain in the book of Romans that while God is holy and I am not, no matter how many good things I do, what? We fall short of the glory, the holiness of God. I don't care how good you think you are. How many times you've helped the United Way or gone down and helped the, the food line at, you know, there at the Clarksburg Mission. I don't care how many times you've sat in a church, whether it's a Baptist church, Presbyterian church, Methodist church, Lutheran church. I don't care. It doesn't matter. I don't care how many times you've been baptized in water. It doesn't matter. How many times you've read through the Bible. It doesn't matter. Listen, no work, no work will ever qualify you for heaven. None. Not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but by his mercy he saved us. And that's it. Amen. God said, I'm going to be merciful to you and save you, despite you. So in that sense, God says, I'm going to accept you as you are. You don't come here trying to impress me. You come here as you are. But you come, acknowledge, listen, you come acknowledging what you are. And that's where sometimes I fear people misunderstand salvation. 
There can be no salvation until a person comes to repentance. Until a person understands they're a sinner undone before God, bound for an eternal hell. And yes, I believe, because this book plainly teaches it, that there is a literal hell. And to avoid those things, you must come to an acknowledgement, God, I'm a sinner. Turn from your sin. I don't mean turn over a new leaf. I mean, God, I can't change myself. God, this is what I am, and I'm dependent on your son to forgive me. And the Bible says the blood of Jesus Christ, God's son, cleanses us, cleans us from all sin, and trust him to do what you can't do. And God says, I want to do this. I'm going to accept you with warts and all. And I'm going to do this. I'm going to take you. I'm going to cover you. I'm going to cover your sin. David understood this. Psalm 32, verses 1 and 2. Blessed is he whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. Blessed is the man unto whom the Lord imputeth not iniquity. There had to come a day where I acknowledged my sin and allowed him to be the propitiation, the covering for my sin. And he forgave me and he saved me. One of the most beautiful pictures of God's love is found in Ezekiel 16. I want you to turn back with me to the Old Testament to Ezekiel chapter 16. And in Ezekiel chapter 16, I want you to read verse 3. Now, this is God speaking to the Jews. And he said, let me remind you what you were. So these, this first verse or two is a reminder to the Jews what they once were. Ezekiel 16, verse 3. Thus saith the Lord God unto Jerusalem, thy birth and thy nativity is of the land of Canaan. Thy father was an Amorite and thy mother an Hittite. Now, that was not a term of endearment. Believe me, that was not a term of endearment. He said, let me just be blunt and tell you what you really are. Verse 4, as for thy nativity, in the day thou wast born, thy navel was not cut, neither wast thou washed in water to supple thee. Thou wast not salted at all, nor swaddled at all. Now I pitied thee to do any of these unto thee, to have compassion upon thee, but thou wast cast out in the open field to the loathing of thy person in the day that thou wast born. And when I passed by thee and saw thee polluted in thine own blood, I said unto thee, when thou wast polluted in thy blood, live. Yea, I said unto thee, when thou wast in thy blood, live. I have caused thee to multiply as the bud of the field. And thou hast increased and waxen great, and thou art come to excellent ornaments. Thy breasts are fashioned, and thine hair is grown, whereas thou wast naked and bare. This is a great verse, verse 8. Now when I passed by thee and looked upon thee, behold, thy time was the time of love. And I spread my skirt over thee and covered thy nakedness. Yea, I swear unto thee and entered into a covenant with thee, saith the Lord God, and thou becamest mine. Verse 8 really says it all. Just like a young man when he first sees that young lady, and, and so we want to say something magical happens. You know, there's an interest there. And he makes the first move, and he manifests his love for that young lady, just like Dan Vaughn did for Holly Ferner all those years ago. He declares, he manifests his love, and then as he gets to know, he finds out that there's no man on earth that doeth good and sinneth not, as Solomon said. Everybody has warts. Everybody has sins. Everybody has transgressed. Everybody has been iniquitous at times. I looked upon thee, and he said, the time was a time of love. The day God looked at Vern Underwood, God said, I love this man, and I want him to be mine. God looked at Zach, and he said, I want Zach to be mine. And he saw us with all of our faults and all of our failures. He said, I'll do something for them. They can't do it for themselves. I'm going to cover them. I'm going to make propitiation and cover their sins with the blood of my son so that when I look at them, their sins and iniquities will I remember no more. They'll be forgotten and forgiven because my son will have bore the punishment for those sins. 
And then he says, I covered the, I covered thy nakedness. I was naked and undone before a holy God. He saw me as I am. But the day that Jesus Christ saved me was the day that he covered me and gave me eternal life. That's a beautiful picture. And that's exactly what happened to you if you're saved. That's what happened to me. One last thing I want you to see before we close this morning. Go back to 1 John chapter 4. Look at verse 14. 1 John 4 verse 14. And we have seen and do testify that the Father sent the Son to be the Savior of the world. You notice, I noticed this the other day in this passage from verse 9 to verse 14. God sent his Son. Verse 9. God sent his Son. Verse 10. God sent his Son. Verse 14. You know what God wants us to understand? He loved you so much, he sent his Son for you. So what do we see here in verse 14? I want you to see that God sent his son that we can have the Savior. Now, understand this. A love story begins by someone manifesting or declaring their love for another. And when that love is received, now listen, and there was a day 45 years ago, October 31st, 1976, I received Jesus' love. I received him as my Savior. And when one who is on the receiving end of love receives the love, you know what they do? They testify to it. Now, when a young woman becomes engaged, she will testify. And this happened plenty of times right here in this building. You know, there's a Saturday night and, you know, this young man who's in love with this young woman and she's in love with him and they go out for a nice dinner and they're sitting there and all of a sudden he pulls out this little box and he opens it and he turns it and he shows her this really beautiful ring with a big old diamond on it. Or if you're like me, a really small diamond on it. We just didn't have a whole bunch of money. And you say, will you what? That was lame. Will you marry me? There you go. And she says, yes. You know, I'm not going to do like the women do it. I, I, anyway, I should get one of the women up here to demonstrate. But you know what? Next Sunday, the next day, she walks into this building and she is beaming. And there's a grin from ear to ear. And somebody says, what is going on? And then she, now I will do this. I hope this is not offensive. She does this. <laughs> I've seen it. You've seen it. It's been, happened right here in this building. You know what? You know what she's doing? Now listen to me. She is testifying of the love that this man has extended to her and she has received it. We're going to get married. You know what you are? You know what I am? Ephesians chapter 5 says that you and I are part of the bride of Christ. And he is the bridegroom. And he looked down and said, I want to literally, in a spiritual sense, marry you. I want you to be mine. And I said yes. And many of you in this auditorium, you said Yes. To Jesus Christ. There's a song that said, Jesus, lover of my soul. You know what? He is. He is the lover of my soul. Song of Solomon is a book I've taught to our young couples in years past. I would not teach it to an entire congregation because I look at it from the literal aspect of a man and a woman, a husband and a wife, but it also has obviously a deep spiritual meaning. Jesus is the bridegroom. We are the bride, and there's supposed to be intimacy between us. Salvation is not just fire insurance from hell. It's intended to be intimate. You fall in love with him more deeply and more deeply and more deeply. And that's why you could sing what we sang in that chorus. I'm happy all the day. You know, when you get married, you really fall in love with your spouse. And uh, Dave and Caroline celebrated their 55th wedding anniversary. We kind of made a big deal out of it there at the, uh, at the uh, sweetheart banquet the other day. If you were to ask them, I think they would tell you, because I sense this in them, that they love each other more today than they loved each other when they first got married. I can say that about my wife. I love her more now than I ever have. I think I see that in a lot of men. You know, I'm, I'm glad to be part of this church family because I see a lot of men who love their wives, and wives who love, wives who love their husbands, and it gets better. You still go through heartache and tragedy. You still go through difficult times, but there's a sense of happiness and contentment 
because you'll, you'll go through it together. You know what? I can go through anything because my bridegroom, Jesus Christ, goes through it with me. He doesn't run and cut out like a lot of men cut out of their wives. And what happens? We have the privilege, when we understand how much God loves us, we have the privilege when we understand that he has accepted us with warts and all and has covered our sin through his blood to testify that the Father sent the Son to be the Savior, not just of me, not just of you, but of the world, to tell others of what has happened and see God do a work in their life. As I said a few moments ago, my love story began 45 years ago on a Sunday morning up in Canton, Ohio. God changed my love. He declared his love for me so that I could live. He gave me eternal life, and I can never perish. That's what John 10.10 says. You can never perish. My warts were evident to God, but he covered my sin in his love. He did the same for you. He became the propitiation for my sin. And now it's my privilege to be able to testify to others of his love. In Song of Solomon, chapter 2, verse 16, I'll just finish with this portion of this verse. It says, my beloved is mine and I am his. Jesus is the picture there. And the writer said, my beloved, Jesus is mine and I am his. I'm so glad to be saved. I'm glad my sins are forgiven. I'm glad I've been washed in the blood of Jesus Christ. I'm glad that the bridegroom goes with me through every trial, every heartache, every sorrow, and that even in the midst of those things, even all the things we've been through in the last two years and the things we will be going through, that he's there. He's there, and he loves us. Praise the Lord for that. I want you to bow your heads for a few moments before we take part in the Lord's table. I want you to stop and I want you to ask yourself this question. Have I ever received the love of the Father when he sent his son down to earth? Has there ever been a moment in your life where you recognized your warts, as I, I put it, your sins, your iniquities, your transgressions? Have there, has there ever been a moment where you have called upon Jesus to forgive you and to be your Savior? Let me just ask this with everybody having their heads bowed at the moment. How many would say, Pastor Ron, I know that I have received Christ as my Savior. There is no question. Would you raise your hand? You can put your hands down. Is there anyone here this morning that would say, you know, Pastor, I'm not certain that that has ever happened in my life. But I would like to know that kind of love. I would like to know his forgiveness. I would like Jesus to be my own Savior. And would you pray for me, Pastor? If you would, you can hold your hand up and I'll pray for you and uh, give you opportunity to act on that desire. Anyone at all to say, I'm not, I don't know that I'm saved, but I want to make certain that I am. Anyone at all. Since most declare yourselves to be Christians now, we come to the Lord's table here in a few moments. The Bible gives a warning. Though he loves us, he tells us not to eat or drink of this cup unworthily. That if there is known sin in your life, that you not take part in this time called communion. And God be more, more thrilled with you honoring his command than for you to worry about someone who might see you not take part in communion and be embarrassed by it. You, you be obedient. If there is known sin in your life, first, I'd encourage you to come get it right. Secondly, you just honor the Lord in that. I'm going to have a verse of invitation, and we'll have you stand right now. And I'm going to have Patty begin to play, and if, if there's a need to come to the altar this morning... Maybe you just want to come and say, Lord, thank you. Thank you for being the bridegroom, declaring your love for me and covering me with your blood. And thank you for the privilege of testifying. You're welcome to come.
And I just encourage everybody in here, if you're saved, make sure that there's nothing between you and the Lord before we observe this time of communion. Make sure your heart is right with him. Search me and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts and see if there be any wicked way in me. Make sure you're right. You can be seated for just a moment. And again, uh, we actually did communion one time. And that was back on September 20th of 2020. And that was the day of our big outbreak. So it's one of the reasons we, we have been doing it this way. So if you would, if you'll take that cup. Now, here, here's our, our desire. If you're not a member of Grace Baptist Church, you are welcome to take part in communion on, on two bases. Number one, you know that you know that you know you're born again. Secondly, that you have been scripturally baptized. When I say scripturally baptized, I mean you have been immersed in water. You have, you have followed the Lord in believer's baptism as his word describes. And if those things have not happened, we ask you refrain from taking part in that. And of course, also, that you just know that your heart is right. And if that's the case, you are more than welcome to take part with us. So if you will, if you'll just take the wafer and it's that first little layer on, on the top of that cup there. I'm going to be reading this morning here out of 1 Corinthians chapter 11. And this was during the time that Jesus sat with his disciples in the upper room and, and shared the Passover, as we now call it the Lord's Supper on that last night with his men. And it says in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 23, For I have received of the Lord that which also I delivered unto you, that the Lord Jesus, the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he brake it and said, Take, eat, this is my body, which is broken for you, this do in remembrance of me. Of course, we remember Jesus' body being broken for us there on the cross. And on that very same cross, the Bible says that his blood was shed much more than being now justified by his blood. The Bible says we shall be saved from wrath through him. And it's the blood that cleanses from sin. Without the shedding of blood, there is no remission. There's no forgiveness of sin. It was necessary for Jesus' blood to be spilled on that cross. I read now from the verse 25 of 1 Corinthians 11. After the same manner also he took the cup when he had supped, saying, This cup is the New Testament in my blood, this do ye as oft as ye drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as ye eat this bread and drink this cup, ye do show the Lord's death till he come. And the Bible just tells us, look, you need to keep remembering. Never forget. Never forget what he's done for you. Never forget the agony that he went through. Never forget the price that he paid. Never forget what he did for you. We can't afford to do that. So as a, as a family, as a church, a body of believers, we're commanded when we gather together, whenever we do, as often as we choose to do it, to make sure we remember him. If you would just do me the favor of taking that little cup and place it in the cup holder in front, and then someone will come later by to pick those up. We'll all stand together, and we often sing the doxology after we have served the Lord's table. So we'll do that this morning, and we'll be dismissed. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise him, all creatures here below. Praise him above, ye heavenly host. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Amen. Thank you for being here this morning. Look forward to seeing you back for the Bible study hour at 5.